good afternoon. Um, the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is wellbeing, economy, fair work, and energy. I'd invite members wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant questions. Quite a bit of interest in supplementaries, so the usual a plea for brevity in questions and indeed in responses. I call question number one, Pam Gossel. Thank you, presiding officer. First of all, I'd like to draw members to attention to my register of interest, which shows I own shares in commercial properties from which I receive no remuneration and I have no running businesses. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it will take in the next financial year to boost the confidence of those operating in the business sector and to promote entrepreneurship. Minister Richard Lockett. The Scottish Government is fully committed to boosting the confidence of our business sector by establishing Scotland as a world-class entrepreneurial nation, which is of course underpinned by our 10-year economic strategy. We absolutely believe in the potential for Scotland to be recognised as one of the best countries to start and grow a business, and we continue to support entrepreneurship with over £13 million funding allocated in the next financial year, and we've also provided £307 million to our enterprise agencies as well. Pam Gossel. I thank the Minister for that response. Research carried out by the Sarvation found that many Scots are increasingly looking beyond Scotland for job opportunities thanks to the SNP higher taxes. The self-employed and business owners were the most likely to think about the shift, with 47% saying they would consider relocating. Does the Minister accept that the First Minister's vaunted New Deal for Business isn't working? And what action will he take to make Scotland an attractive location to live and work? Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for her uh, questions. And I would point out, of course, just in the last few days, I have spoken to a number of businesses in Scotland who are expanding mm -hmm. and recruiting more people in Scotland and are very confident yeah. about the future, particularly in many of the tech sectors, for instance, and energy transition areas of the economy. So it's quite an exciting time in parts of the Scottish economy. Just now. I don't think we should talk it down uh, as a, an attractive location for people to come and live and work in Scotland. What we're also finding is that many people are relocating to Scotland, particularly from London. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to companies who are recruiting well from London because people want to move to Scotland for the quality of life and some of the other benefits they get from Scottish Government policies as well at the same time. So, of course, we have to pay close attention to the issues raised by the member uh, and the views of the business community going forward. And our new deal for business, of course, is the best forum for doing that at the current time. And we're listening carefully to what they are saying. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries. First, Fergus Ewing. Um, presiding officer, uh, in the next financial year, businesses uh, south of the border in the UK will receive 75% rates relief in the hospitality sector. Here, they will receive zero relief. Given that these businesses, hotels, pubs and restaurants and some visitor attractions like bingo clubs in my constituency uh, have incurred major debt to survive the shutdown and lockdown in COVID, is that really a, not a serious competitive disadvantage? And will the Minister not urge the Scottish Government in the forthcoming budget to match this lifeline rates relief for Scotland's hospitality sector? Minister. Can I thank Fergus Ewing for highlighting the challenges facing many hospitality businesses in Scotland at the moment? And of course, it's quite a mixed picture. I've spoken to many hospitality businesses that are investing significant amounts of uh, resource for the future and expanding. And uh, indeed, and just returned from, from Isla, uh, speaking to a tourism summit there and speaking to many local businesses. But there are indeed many challenges on Isla and throughout the whole of the country in the hospitality sector. Uh, under Scottish Government policy, we estimate that 63% of hospitality businesses will not be paying any rates whatsoever. And of course, the budget extends uh, as part of the current arrangements relief for island hospitality businesses, uh, which is just to help the particular challenges many of our islands are facing as well. Can I also just say to the member, of course we can tend to look at all these issues, but we face a very difficult budget settlement from the UK government, so we can't achieve everything we'd like to achieve in the draft budget. But can I also say that many of the factors expressed to me by the hospitality sector relate to increased raw material costs due to inflation, increased interest rates, and increased energy bills. So the source of this problem is very much at the UK level, and we continue to bring these matters to attention to the UK government as well. 
Thank you. I'm going to have to ask for briefer, certainly supplementary questions and responses. Briefly, Daniel Johnson. Uh, there's a good deal of concern about what the impact of the draft budget will have on our enterprise agencies. Could the Minister outline how many businesses were supported by enterprise agencies in the last year as compared to pre-COVID times? Minister. Well, clearly, I'm happy to <clears throat> look into those figures. I don't have them to at hand, as the member I'm sure it would expect to be the case. What I can say, though, is, ironically, I was just meeting enterprise agencies this morning who are pointing to some of the significant success of companies they've been supporting uh, over the past year, and the official statistics for that will be released in, in the coming weeks, I expect. So our enterprise companies are uh, carrying out a great deal of fantastic work supporting your business community in Scotland. That's why our exports are doing very well compared to the rest of the UK. That's why our investment projects in Scotland are doing very well compared to the rest of the UK. So the enterprise companies are doing a fine job at the moment supporting the business community. Question two, Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussion it has had with the UK Government regarding actions that can be taken to preserve energy networks following periods of bad weather. Minister Gillian Martin. Thank you. As the member rightly outlines, policy and regulation of energy networks in the UK, including their operation, maintenance and resilience, are reserved to the UK Government. But Scottish Government officials maintain regular contact with UK Government counterparts on energy network resilience topics. And last week, Scottish Government Resilience Division officials attended the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero meeting where winter energy risk and disruption contingency planning were discussed and were also working with Ofgem, the electricity system operator and industry on reforms to and expansion of the electricity grid so that electricity networks are robust, effective and work for Scotland. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank the Minister for the answer. <coughs> Strom Asia saw thousands across Scotland lose power, with some being unable to be reconnected for over a day. This greatly impacted those with disabilities or mobility issues who require electrical equipment to live in and complete tasks within their home. What discussion has the Scottish Government had with the energy networks in Scotland regarding additional help and reimbursement for those who have additional needs when they are left without power due to energy disruption and blackouts? Minister. So, um, Faisal Chowdhury outlines a situation that, as a backbencher, I brought up as well after the, the, the aftermath of Storm Arwen, which was seven days in my constituency of, of having no power for many thousands of people. Um, it's something that I'm always keen to pick up with the, the, the operators. I've got, uh, had a very constructive meeting with SSE and SSEN, I think it was last week, on their rolling maintenance programmes for lines and also preventing damage to those lines in storm situations like the maintenance and tree cutting that they do but also the, the work that they're doing to have their vulnerable customer registers updated so that they know when, when to step in to people that actually will have vulnerabilities such as the member outlines. There's great work being done with local authorities, police, fire, healthcare services and response and resilience working with the, 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 the uh, electricity uh, suppliers, uh, le leading the, um, learning the lessons from Storm Arwen and subsequent storms as well. We also had a discussion, Cabinet Secretary and I, with the ESO last week on reforms and expansion of the network. Thank you. And very brief supplementary, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Minister didn't mention the issue of a railway network, and given that it is becoming more and more powered by electricity, what work is being done to have that cross UK discussion to make sure our rail network is reliable and resilient going forward in terms of electricity supply? As briefly as possible, Minister. Well, I'm happy to refer that on to Fiona Hislop, who's obviously got responsibility for transport, but Sarah Boyd makes a very good point. Increasingly, as we're changing the, the networks over to being uh, electrically powered, um, that is a, a something that we need to take into account as well in terms of resilience planning. Question three, Bob Doris. Hey, President officer, firstly, I should declare an interest. I am a trustee of the charity Spirit of Springburn, which is currently active in its efforts to develop a local place plan for the area to help boost town centre regeneration, which is relevant to the question I'm asking, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its city strategy supports town centres within cities to be a vibrant destination which offer a range of services and amenities to support the community. Cabinet Secretary Neil Craig. Thank you, President Officer. We are committed to supporting the vibrancy of our 
uh, towns within cities as we continue to implement the world leading town centre first principle and support uh, progress through the town centre action plan. Uh, this is our call to action, both locally and nationally, to revitalise our towns and support the delivery of enterprise and communities and town centre living. And in collaboration with uh, town, uh, Scotland's town partnership, we also support the Scotland Loves Local campaign, uh, which uh, aims to encourage people back into local towns, increase footfall and ultimately support uh, businesses to offer diverse services and amenities for the local community, which is an economic multiplier. Bob Doris. Uh, I welcome that answer, but for city-based town centres, the pool of city, city centres and the lure of out-of-town shopping creates a significant double challenge, and these can be particularly profound in areas with high levels of deprivation. Can I ask what account the city's strategy takes of those challenges facing town centres within cities in particular, such as Springburn in my constituency, and whether dedicated funds are available to support them, such as the former Town Centre Regeneration Fund, which previously benefited Mary Hill within my constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank Bob Doris for that and recognise his long-standing interest in this area, given his work uh, for the Mary Hill uh, Borough Halls and, and uh, uh, the continued uh, programmes of work that he is supporting with his con in, within his constituency. Uh, as uh, uh, I've said, uh, we continue to support uh, our world-leading town centre first principle uh, as a joint uh, commitment to encourage uh, people back into towns and put the health of our town centres uh, at the heart of decision making. Uh, this is underpinned by the National Planning Framework 4, which recognises towns within our cities as a national asset and seeks to promote uh, and facilitate development. I understand Glasgow City Council has established a local place development plan fund to help support communities develop local place plans. That's going to be ever more important uh, as the role uh, and uh, usage of town centres changes uh, with people's changing shopping habits. And briefly, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It was deeply disappointing to learn today that the latest round of the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund has been put on hold due to the announced cut on capital spending on that fund from £62 million to £45 million. This will affect four projects in Glasgow, including one in which I chair, the Spring Winter Gardens, which has applied for essential capital funding. What will the Minister do to expedite these decisions and ensure that the capital fund for these critical programmes is protected? Cabinet uh, Mr Sweeney will understand the financial landscape within which uh, the Scottish Government is uh, operating within, with a 10% cut to our capital budget coming down the line and increased costs against those uh, capital allocations because of uh, inflation, making some of these uh, projects very difficult to come forward with and he will understand uh, the review that is currently uh, underway from the Deputy First Minister into all these. Uh, but I also understand uh, the importance that Mr Sweeney places upon uh, this fund uh, and recognise the good work that it can do uh, and so we will continue to make, keep that under review uh, to ensure that our town centres can continue to receive our support. Thank you. Question four, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has held with the South of Scotland Enterprise regarding any preliminary analysis of the outcome of its recently implemented four-day working week pilot. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. The aim of the uh, four-day uh, working week uh, public sector pilot is to assess environmental health and well-being benefits and efficiency gains that a four-day working week could bring. Uh, the pilot will ensure meaningful insights are gained into the benefits and risks of a four-day uh, working week approach. The Scottish Government has held uh, one high-level discussion with the South Scotland Enterprise on the future interim evaluation of their four-day week uh, pilot, uh, and the meeting uh, didn't cover details of the results, as the interim evaluation is still pending completion uh, and analysis uh, by SOCI uh, and Autonomy, the expert partner organisation. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I met with the Soci leadership team on Friday last week and heard how the pilot is already beginning to boost staff morale, increase productivity and contribute to greater wellbeing in the workplace. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment how it is working with business to show the evidence of whether a four-day working week is beneficial? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, conversations uh, with business and employer organisations uh, on a more flexible approach to the employment market uh, continue. Those are uh, forums that uh, we hold, uh, such as the New Deal for Business Group, looking at the economic uh, impact of having a more flexible labour market approach uh, and also uh, to their trading uh, environment uh, and ensuring they have access to a wider pool uh, of uh, potential employees because of the greater flexibility that such an approach could take. Uh, obviously, that's going to be a, on, based on commercial decision-making by those individual employers, but those, those discussions will continue. And briefly, Ivan McKee. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask what additional costs will be incurred by SOSI from their limited budget as a consequence of implementing this policy and what assessment has been made of how much it would cost uh, were this policy to be implemented across the entire Scottish Government and its agencies? I thank uh, Ivan McKee uh, for uh, his interest and uh, no, his long-standing interest in, in uh, this uh, area. Uh, SOSI has not uh, and have not incurred any direct costs from uh, volunteering to participate in the pilot. There are some uh, small uh, staffing costs related to time devoted to the engagement with autonomy as the ex expert uh, partner supporting this work. Uh, and the pilot will ensure the meaningful uh, insights are gained from the benefits and risks of a four-day working week approach. Uh, but as it is a pilot, no assessment has been made on uh, the cost to implement this policy across other public sector bodies, uh, including the Scottish Government. Question five, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the growth of international exports. Minister Richard Lockhead. A trading nation guides our approach to increasing Scotland's international exports. And as part of that plan, we have added more international trade specialists, nearly doubled the Global Scot Network, increased our trade envoy network from four to eleven, and run a programme of major events uh, at other events such as Dubai Expo, COP26 and COP28 and Scottish Enterprise Support helped achieve £1.73 billion of projected export sales in 2022-23. And there are other sector export plans as well in technology, life sciences uh, and other key sectors. And we work with the Scottish Chambers also finally on delivering 100 trade missions under the particular programme we have with them, generating £20 million in projected export sales. Audrey Nicholl. Thank the Minister for that response. In recent weeks, we have seen more of the same from the fallout of Brexit. A trade deal with Canada has broken down, and while new import controls have constrained Scotland, our neighbours and friends in Northern Ireland, who also voted Remain, get a completely different deal. We have also even seen over the weekend that because of Brexit, even a former Scottish Labour leader voted SNP during the European elections. Mm -hmm. does, the cabinet, does, does the Minister agree with me that this demonstrates not only that the Tory UK government is making up its Brexit policy as it goes along, but that Labour also cannot be trusted to stand up for Scotland on this highly important issue? Minister. <laughs> Audrey Nicholl is correct. Brexit has been an unmitigated disaster for Scotland. And whilst we expect the Tories not to support Scotland on this issue, it's particularly disappointing the Labour Party are going to continue with the pro-Brexit policy, which is causing some What is also disappointing Scotland. is the exchanges between both front benches, which will cease, Minister. Can I also say, Deputy President Officer, so much for a union of equals given we are paying close attention to the welcome progress, of course, in Northern Ireland, but at the same time recognising that the barriers to trade uh, do not exist there under the current uh, proposals, whereas Scotland, that likewise voted against Brexit, will continue to have barriers trading with Europe. That's completely unacceptable. And, of course, it, many businesses the length and breadth of Scotland are suffering as a result of Brexit, which we voted against. And brief supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. If the SNP is so keen to support international exports, why has it opposed every trade deal done by the UK government? Minister. Well, I recall very well that the former Rural Affairs Secretary in the UK government spoke out against his own government's trade deals because they betrayed yeah. Scotland's farmers and rural industries, such as the deal with New Zealand and the deals with some other countries uh, as well. So it's really important that as the UK government goes round with the begging bowl around Scotland post-Brexit, trying to get deals at any cost, that this government in Scotland remains vigilant to stand up for Scottish industries yeah. and make sure they're not betrayed by the Tory government. Yeah, well, Question so. six, Ros McCall. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether, as part of the implementation of the recommendations of the City Centre Recovery Task Force report, the role of larger retail stores and city centres is being considered. Cabinet Yes, implementation of the recommendations in the task force uh, report is led by the Scottish Cities Alliance, of which the Scottish Government is a member. The report identifies seven priority outcomes to ensure city centres have a strong and vibrant offer to attract visitors, residents and uh, tourists, as we referred to in answer to a previous question. Uh, it did not consider the detail of the uh, role uh, of larger re retail stores. Retail is an important component of a vibrant city centre economy. Our retail strategy encourages our retailers to promote city centres as retail and cultural destinations. Ros McCall. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. According to Scottish Retail Consortium, 
Larger retail stores employ a high share of retail jobs and provide a significant share of low-cost everyday essentials for customers. Shops liable for the higher property rate have been paying more than their English counterparts for the past eight years, and now there's a threat of rates surtax on grocers. So given that the City Centre Recovery Task Force report already emphasises the need for out-of-town larger retail stores to be restricted, and the prominence of large department stores on Scottish High Street, why does the Cabinet Secretary believe Scottish stores are better placed than their counterparts down south to be paying more rates? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, uh, I, I'm assuming that Ros McCall still supports the austerity agenda that has been a hallmark of the UK government over the last decade and a half that is uh, pushing us into the position of having to look at broadening uh, our revenue base. Uh, and the, con the discussions uh, with the likes of the Scottish Retail Consortium uh, are ongoing. I'm, I'm due to meet uh, with them, with the Deputy First Minister and, and Tom Arthur uh, this afternoon, uh, indeed, because this is a consultation that we're talking about in terms of the retail surtax. Uh, and in terms of the non-domestic rates, 90 5% of businesses in Scotland pay lower rates uh, here in Scotland than they do elsewhere uh, in the UK. Uh, the small business bonus scheme means that we've got 100,000 business properties in Scotland taken out of rates uh, altogether. So in, even in a very difficult financial landscape that has been made worse by decisions taken at a UK level, we're still investing in supporting the trading landscape of our businesses here in Scotland. And briefly, Gordon MacDonald. The City Centre Recovery Task Force is supporting Scotland's eight city centres at a time when businesses are facing increasing the cost of food and goods as a result of new import controls. The UK government estimates the new Brexit red tape will cost businesses an extra £330 million a year. Seven years after Scotland rejected Brexit, what is the Scottish Government's assessment of its impact on retail and businesses? As brief as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the business uh, survey data shows that many uh, businesses in the retail and wholesale sector continue to report additional costs uh, due to Brexit, with 30 per cent of businesses reporting additional costs in Scotland, 21 per cent due to uh, red tape, 14 per cent reported higher transportation costs, and 9 per cent faced extra tariffs, directly, directly responsibility uh, of uh, Brexit. It clearly varies by sector as the import and export variances, but uh, I am still to see or hear a positive uh, viewpoint of Brexit from a business and economy perspective, uh, only negatives. Uh, and it is clear, whichever party uh, is returned to government uh, at, after the UK general election, that the economic pain will continue as both Labour and the Conservatives are signed up to that Brit Brexit Britain future and the economic drag that it causes. Independence is the only way back. Question, into the question seven, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact of the reduction in funding for Highlands and Islands Enterprise on women in business. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. We have prioritised uh, funding for Highlands and Islands Enterprise to the extent possible given the extremely challenging settlement, but the reduction to its budget will require it to revisit its plans for 24-25 and to be rigorous uh, in deciding uh, which activity it can support. Uh, I know that High will continue to make a key contribution to achieving the government's objectives, including through its support for women in business. And having had regular engagement with both the Chair and Chief Executive in recent months, I will be meeting uh, again with them shortly to discuss how we can continue to work together to achieve our joint ambitions, boost investment accelerate opportunities across the region and maximise the impact of avail available resources. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Shetland is rightly pr proud of its world-famous textile and knitwear heritage, and Shetland Wool Week attracts knitters from around the globe to the islands each autumn. HIE's budget faces further cuts, which would total 40% since 2018-19, but the significant concern that in the small women-led businesses in the creative industries in Shetland, funding won't be there to help them address the current threat to their businesses. Changes in the operation of the textile facilitation unit at UHI Shetland mean individual local producers face a serious challenge to continue to the production of their innovative designs, which are very much in demand. So what can the Scottish Government do to ensure HIE is in a position to support these women in business who want to keep this traditional sector alive? Cabinet Secretary. And I think this is a, a very fair point from uh, Beatrice Wisher. And the, the market uh, changing as it has and the, the popularity uh, of um, traditional uh, knitwear, Fair Isle, Gansies and others is, is evident and is growing. Uh, indeed, the uh, offering from uh, your own constituency, President Officer, uh, is, is also uh, evident. So I am well aware of this. I'll continue to work with Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, on what can be done to support that as, a, as export potential uh, and uh, ensure that, as Beatrice Wisher's point 
which points out uh, that these uh, largely women-led businesses continue to be supported. And briefly, John Swinney. Uh, officer, in advancing the arguments put forward by Beatrice Wishart about encouraging more women to enter business, is the government prepared to engage in dialogue with Women's Enterprise Scotland to make use of the formidable resources and skills and capacity that they have to offer in this agenda? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely. I can give the assurance to uh, John Swinney, as he'd expect, that I have uh, already had a significant uh, engagement with Women's Enterprise uh, Scotland uh, and uh, will continue to look at what more can be done to support uh, women-led businesses and uh, through Anna Stewart's Pathways uh, report uh, how we can actually encourage a greater proportion of women uh, to start their own businesses in the first place, which we've invested uh, millions of pounds over last year and this coming year uh, into achieving. And question eight, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress against the five fair work benchmarks in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government reports on progress on the National Strategy for Economic Transformation through its annual reports. Uh, the most recent, uh, from June 2023, showed that in 2022, 94.1% of employees were in contractually secure employment uh, and 35.4% were affected by collective bargaining arrangements. Updated estimates are available for the gender pay gap, which was 1.7% for full-time employees in 2023. Estimates re released last month indicate that 89.9 per cent of employees aged 18 and over earned above the real living wage in Scotland last year, and the latest employment rate in Scotland was 74.4 per cent for September to November 23. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much. It is disappointing that the SNP Government has decided to cut the £10 million Flexible Workforce Development Fund, a key intervention to support upskilling um, across the Scottish economy. As a result of that, some 2,000 employers and 45,000 learners will miss out on training opportunities from April onwards. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Stephen Montgomery, Director of the Scottish Hospitality Group, who said that losing the fund is another sucker blow for many hospitality businesses who used and relied on the fund to develop career paths for their employees. It was seen for many employers as a great aid for recruitment and giving training for career progression, and it is essential that the Scottish Government rethink this budget cut. Or does the Cabinet Secretary think that Stephen Montgomery and the many other businesses, trade unions and colleges are simply wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you uh, very much, President Officer. Uh, no, I uh, have received uh, that representation. I understand the challenges that are being uh, faced, uh, and I hope Jackie Bailey would understand the challenges that are being faced by government in taking very difficult decisions uh, in the financial landscape we are entering. I assume that is the first of the Labour Party's uh, representations uh, on the budget, uh, because I believe that that hasn't arrived as yet. And if that is an area that uh, Jackie Bailey wishes to see uh, change within the budget, then we look forward to those discussions. The Deputy First Minister uh, is more than uh, willing to have those discussions on a constructive basis. Uh, in Scotland, we have lower unemployment, a lower gender pay gap, the highest proportion of workers paid at least the real living wage. That is because of the investments that we uh, are making uh, compared to elsewhere in the UK, and we will continue to ensure that we provide that support so that we have a strong workforce for employers going forward. Uh, thank you, and with apologies to those I was not able to call, that concludes portfolio questions on wellbeing, economy, fair work and uh, energy. There will be a brief pause uh, before we move to the next portfolio to allow the front benches to change. Okay, and the next portfolio is finance and parliamentary business. Again, there is a lot of interest in this, so members wishing to ask a supplementary uh, question should press their uh, request to speak buttons during the relevant questions, but should be brief in their questions and brief as possible in the responses. I'd also remind members um, that questions one and eight uh, will be taken together, and I'll take any supplementaries on those after the questions have uh, been posed. And I qu uh, call question number one, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how much it's allocated to local authorities from its 2024-25 budget. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. The Scottish Government are providing record funding of over £14 billion to local authorities, including funding for the council tax freeze. 
we have also allocated an increasing share of the discretionary Scottish budget to the local government settlement for 24-25, highlighting the importance the Scottish Government places on our local services. Neil Bibby. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has found the Finance Secretary's budget spin has been misleading. Meanwhile, the Finance Secretary told me in this very chamber on the 1st of November 2023 that the Government took advice from civil servants in the normal manner regarding the Council Tax Freeze announcement at SNP conference. It's subsequently been revealed by the Daily Record civil servants were in fact just given seven hours notice. Does the Minister agree with the comments that the Finance Secretary made to me in this chamber in November? And if so, how can he stand up with any credibility and say this decision was made in the normal way and expect us to believe it? Minister. There's two points there. I, I, I need to unpack the point around the IFS. The Scottish Government um, brings forward its draft budget in line with the recommendations of this Parliament's Finance Committee yeah. comparing the draft budget to the draft budget. In terms of the Council tax freeze, I think the Labour Party just needs to put their hands up and tell us what they actually think. I, the people of Scotland are absolutely clear that in these difficult times, a council tax freeze is absolutely crucial. The question for Mr Bibby is, does he and his Labour colleagues support a council tax freeze or do they support putting council tax up across Scotland? Will he back the people of Scotland or does he want to increase the council tax? OK, as with the previous portfolio, we'll have the questions asked. And we'll have the questions answered without the person who's asked the question then providing a running commentary. Question number eight, Katie Clark. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration is being given to increasing the funding settlement for local authorities. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Despite a worst case autumn statement that did not prioritise public services, the budget delivers record funding for local government and will continue to work with Clausula through the Very House Agreement to ensure the sustainability of local services. We will continue to work with local government throughout the year ahead to ensure that, that we are able to provide the services that the people of Scotland want and need. Katie Clark. It is not just the IFS who are challenging the Scottish Government's figures. Cosla also say that local government is facing a real terms cut given significant cuts to both core revenue and capital budgets and that using reserves is not financially stable. Their figures are confirmed by SPICE. Will the Minister revisit the funding settlement? Minister. I think the starting point is to go back to my point that the, the budget figures that we produce are in line with the requirements of the Finance Committee. Um, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I think we know that this has been an absolute disastrous settlement for Scotland from the UK Government. Um, so rather than simply backing up the Tories and saying the Scottish Government needs to find more money from within that limited budget, surely the member will join with the Scottish Government and call on the UK Government to use the, the spring budget in order to prioritise public services to ensure there's more money for Scotland, including Scottish local services. Number of supplementaries. First, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister advise if any opposition party has come forward with alternative budget proposals, costed or otherwise, that would increase local authority funding? And given that Labour plans to have a bomb-proof UK manifesto that will mimic the Tories, with whom Labour is already in de facto coalition in Edinburgh, Fife, North and South Lanarkshire, Stirling and West Lothian, has the Minister had any indication whatsoever that a change in UK government will mean greater resources being made available to the Scottish Government to allocate to our local authorities? Minister. So, so on the fir first point, Deputy First Minister has confirmed to me that um, there has been no suggestions from the Labour Party um, about how the, the Scottish Government could further increase the increased resource, uh, share resource going to local government this year. Absolutely nothing. But on, on, the, on the wider point, Mr Gibson makes a very strong point. The Deputy First Minister met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury two weeks ago and made it clear that the UK Government needs to prioritise investment in public services over tax cuts in the forthcoming UK Spring Budget. Surely we it's not unreasonable to expect support, not just from the benches behind us, but from, from colleagues right across the chamber, to call for more spending for public services rather than tax cuts for the rich. And listen. 
Uh, COSLA, in its uh, budget briefing yesterday, was complaining bitterly that the multi-year funding settlement as set out in the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy has not yet been delivered. Can I ask when it will be? Minister. I, I, I think everyone knows that multi-year settlements would be, would be better, but given the massive uncertainty that we have in relation to the funding that this Parliament, this Government gets from the UK Government, it would be, I think, disingenuous to give further um, multi-year settlements which actually are based on um, sand. Okay, and question two, Stuart McMillan. Ask the Scottish Government uh, what dialogue it has had with Inverclyde Council regarding the Scottish Budget for 2024-25. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Scottish Government ministers and officials meet regularly with COSLA and individual local authorities to discuss a range of issues. Scottish Government has had extensive engagement with COSLA on behalf of all 32 local authorities in regards to the 24-25 local government finance settlement. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank the Minister for that reply. The Minister will be very much aware of the social and economic challenges that my constituency faces uh, and I will always advocate for more money uh, to go to Inverclyde as I recognise the consequence of the cause I agreed funding formula uh, which only exacerbates our issues with population decline and deprivation as it is heavily weighted towards an area's population level. But can the Minister indicate whether there is any scope for additional resource to go to Inverclyde Council as they are receiving a 4.8 per cent budget increase lower than most other affluent council areas uh, in, the, in Scotland uh, and due to the aforementioned to cause the funding formula. Minister. I thought and Stuart McMillan is a strong advocate for his constituency, um, but it is important to acknowledge the, uh, the role that deprivation plays in the, the funding formula and to recognise that Inverclyde continues to receive funding equivalent to £159 a head, that's 6.2 per cent, uh, more than the, the, the Scottish average. Um, that's equivalent to £12.3 million more overall than they would receive if, if um, funded at the Scottish average. But the Scottish Government remains committed to strengthening the Inverclyde economy and it's current, um, currently considering investment proposals from the Inverclyde Task Force with that aim. And the Minister for Small Business, Innovation, Tourism and Trade is due to attend the, the next task force meeting on the 20th of February. Um, as the member mentioned, the, the, the wider formula in terms of distribution is a matter for COSLA, um, but the Scottish Government is always keen to hear suggestions on how that can be taken forward, but it has to be in collaboration with COSLA. Thank you. Question three, Sandra Skolhani. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has made of the potential impact on its medium-term financial strategy and future Scottish budgets of reports that the cost of a national care service could rise to £2 billion. Deputy First Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, our medium-term financial strategy will be updated later this year and the medium-term uh, financial framework for health and social care will be published this spring. The costs of the National Care Service are continually reviewed as demonstrated by the recent update on the National Care Service Bill provided to the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The £2 billion quoted as a cost forecast over 10 years for the bill as introduced and does not reflect the proposed government amendments for a new shared accountability approach to delivery, so the figures quoted are therefore an outdated position. The update clearly uh, set this out and should, should Parliament accept those amendments at stage two, the cost of implementing the National Care Service will reduce substantially to between £238 million, uh, and £345 million over 10 years. And finally, the bill also includes a commitment to breaks for carers, the cost of which would be between £393 million and £571 million over 10 years. Sandra Schoolhound. Uh, Declaration of Interest is a practising NHS GP. Well, I'm glad that someone is getting an update because it's certainly not the Health Committee. Uh, the Finance Committee is unhappy with the National Care Service financial memorandum and are still scrutinising it. Given that the start date for the bill is many years in the future, how can we be confident that the money allocated will be enough? The government don't even know the number of additional staff that will be needed to deliver the service on the ground. Given the SNP's appalling record on public projects, notably the disastrous Edinburgh tram scheme, will the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that the sum of £2 billion will... It's incredible John okay, Swinney's laughing. Dr Gulhani, if you resume your seat, 
As I've said on three occasions now, could we please listen to the questions and listen to the responses as respectfully as possible? Can you please complete your question, Dr Gulhani? It's incredible that John Swinney is laughing after what we said to, about him. But given the SNP's appalling record on public projects, notably the disastrous Edinburgh tram scheme, will the Minister guarantee, the Cabinet Secretary guarantee, the sum of £2 billion, that's already a billion higher, will not rise further? Or will this be another case of vastly escalated costs based purely on pursuing SNP dogma Thank you. only De for the De SNP De to De 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 So, Presiding Officer, first of all, on infrastructure projects, of course, it was the Tories who voted for the Edinburgh yeah. tram yeah. system. Sorry. And I don't think a Tory coming here has any grounds to criticise because I could talk about HS2, I could talk about aircraft carriers. I really think Sandesh Gulhani should perhaps have a little bit more humility when it comes to his government's infrastructure projects. He also clearly didn't listen to my answer when I said that the £2 billion is not what the plan is. I gave him the revised figures clearly in my answer. And Sandesh Gulhani should really update his knowledge of the position. A willful misunderstanding of the position of the costs of the National Care Service is a bit like presiding officers, his unedifying willful misunderstanding of the public health evidence on minimum unit pricing. I think perhaps he should go away and do his homework. I supplement you, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. The um, Finance Committee has heard worrying and at times deeply confused evidence from the Minister and officials suggesting the cost of the original proposals as introduced to Parliament and on which Parliament will be asked to vote at stage one could have been as much as £3.9 billion. Mm. So is it not the case that the Government has lost control of this flagship bill, which now amounts to a little more than expensive bureaucracy? And can the Deputy First Minister confirm that the cost of this legislation will not recruit a single extra care worker or put a penny more in care workers' pockets? Deputy First Minister. Well, we are putting money in care workers' pockets by our commitment and delivery in the next financial year of £12 an hour. And, of course, Michael Mara may not remember that the National Care Service used to be Labour Party policy, which has now shifted for reasons I don't quite understand. I set out my, the figures in my initial answer, which are very, very clear. Uh, and if those are accepted at stage two, then the costs of implementing the National Care Service will reduce to between £238 million and £345 million pounds over 10 years. Uh, that is very clear and I would hope something the Labour Party would support. Question four, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest engagement has been with the UK Government regarding cost of living support. Deputy First Minister. So I met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury two weeks ago and raised the continuing need to support people with the cost of living. I made clear that the UK Government should prioritise investment in public services over tax cuts in the forthcoming UK Spring Budget. I again pressed the UK Government to introduce an essentials guarantee to ensure that the universal credit enables households to cover essential costs such as food and utilities. Uh, since 2022-23, the Scottish Government continues to allocate around £3 billion a year to policies which tackle poverty and protect people as far as possible during the ongoing cost of living crisis. Claire Hockey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and as she outlined in part of her answer the Scottish Government is doing all it can with its limited powers and fixed budget to improve living standards and address the cost of living crisis including through the Scottish Child Payment, capping in tenancy rent increases and freezing council tax. However, Westminster is failing to act in the areas they have responsibility for, including on energy costs and spiralling mortgage bills. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK Government should have introduced a £400 energy bill support scheme to help households over the winter months, as well as set up a social tariff to help the more vulnerable customers and look to introduce mortgage interest relief to help homeowners? Deputy First Minister. Well, as Claire Hawkey has quite rightly pointed out, the Scottish Government can't mitigate everything connected with UK austerity. Many of the tools to tackle 
the cost of living rest with the UK Government. I called on the Chancellor to reinstate the £400 energy bills support scheme in last year's UK Autumn Statement. I also called for a social tariff scheme that would provide a much needed safety net for priority cut, uh, consumers and we continue to press for this. The Chancellor, of course, chose to ignore these calls and prioritise tax cuts over public services. The UK spring budget is, of course, an opportunity for the UK Government to change course and support people with the cost of living. And briefly, Daniel Johnson. On the topic of utility bills, water bills are going up by 8%, despite Scottish Water Reserves now sitting at almost £2 billion. How is that justified, given that Scottish Water could clearly absorb or defer that increase? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, Scottish Water have made sure that over the years, uh, customers in Scotland have been paying significantly less than customers south of the border. But what is important are the investment plans that Scottish Water has, because people want to make sure that the investment in the infrastructure across Scotland is fit for purpose, and the, um, the infrastructure plans that Scottish Water have are contingent on them being able to raise the revenue in order to make those investments. And question Five, Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how its budget for 2024 to 25 will support the delivery of local services in the Mid Scotland and Fife region. Deputy First Minister. Um, of, the budget delivers an additional £795.7 million of funding for all local authorities, including those in Mid Scotland and Fife, equivalent to a 6% uh, cash increase. The budget also baselines almost £1 billion of funding uh, prior to an agreement on an assurance and accountability framework to offer councils greater flexibility on how these services are delivered. Mardu Fraser. I thank the Deputy First Minister for her response. The Scottish Government's budget for the coming year is up in both cash and real terms over the current year, but delivers savage cuts to local services. According to COSLA, a cut in core revenue of £62.7 million compared to the current year. In my region, Perth and Kinross Council are closing public toilets, restricting access to... Mr Gibson. Mr Fraser. Mr Thank you, Gibson. Officer. In my region, Perth and Kinross Council are closing public toilets, restricting opening hours of recycling centres, and there's a real prospect of Perth Ice Rink, the Leisure Pool yep. and local sports centres being closed and not replaced. Who should residents in Perth and Kinross blame for these cuts to services? Is it the SNP-run council or the SNP-run Scottish Government? First minute. Well, let me remind Murdo Fraser that the Tory-controlled UK Government did not give a penny for local government and the consequentials for 2024-25, not a single penny came for local government. Lots for business tax cuts, not a single penny for local government. So if Murdo Fraser thinks that the funding for local government is the overriding priority here, why does he not have a word with the UK Tory Chancellor to make sure that in the spring budget on the 6th of March, then we get more money for local government? Because that is where the issue begins. And can I just correct him on the funding available to local government? Um, it has a, an increased 6% in cash terms, 4.3% in real terms, taking into account the £144 million to support the council tax freeze. In difficult circumstances, presiding officer, I think that is a fair deal. Mr Fraser, Mr. Fraser I would encourage you not to follow the lead of Mr Gibson and shouting from a sedentary position. A brief supplementary, Willie Rennie. Five Council Leader David Ross has written to the First Minister warning that Fife is on, teetering on the edge of a housing emergency. Now, he points out that there is a 26 per cent reduction in the capital funding for affordable housing budget. He says that is making the situation a whole lot worse. But he wants to know from the Minister why there is a cut of 26 per cent when the overall capital budget has only been cut by 4.3 per cent. Why Deputy is First that? Minister. Well, the capital budget is being cut by 10 per cent uh, over the next few years. That amounts to uh, £1.6 billion pounds, uh, over this parliamentary term. That is a huge reduction uh, in our capital availability, something that I put centre stage at the meeting with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, because infrastructure investment 
is important, including in affordable housing. As I made clear at the Finance Committee uh, when I was giving evidence, should capital availability improve at the spring budget on the 6th of March, then my absolute overriding priority is to improve the position of the affordable housing supply programme. But I cannot confirm that until I know whether or not the 6th of March will bring an improved position on capital and resource spending or a negative position on capital and resource spending. I need to know that before I can make that decision. And question six, Ivan McKee. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of how much money it expects to be able to reallocate from back office costs to frontline services in its budget as a result of its work on public sector reform. Deputy First Minister. So I, I set out a programme of actions alongside the budget in December to, to do just that. The budget itself provided an em envelopes within which we expect our public services to operate over the coming years and we expect our partners across the public sector to shape their services in both the short and longer term, driving efficiencies into their planning. Reducing the cost of service is part of this, and we've made it clear that we expect to see all parts of the Scottish public sector, including the Scottish Government itself, to explore efficiency measures, including for workforce, to, in order to extract maximum value from public spending. Work continues to develop metrics to capture the investment required and the savings generated across this long-term programme of reform. Ivan McKee. Core Scottish Government running costs are now more than £700 million per year, and this does not include the running costs of 129 agencies and non-departmental public bodies. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how much is the total running costs of all these bodies and how much she expects to be able to reduce these costs by through the Public Sector Reform Programme? Deputy First Minister. Um, so our approach to reform includes testing public bodies on the scope they each have to work more efficiently with more impact, not just alone, but across organisations as well. In terms of the size and function and the operating challenges that bodies face, we consider this approach to be more effective than perhaps applying a standard running cost savings target to all uh, bodies. Uh, but what I would say um, is that savings uh, will uh, have to be made. That is a key priority through a number of corporate efficiency levers being implemented, including the Single Scottish Estate Programme, the Commercial Value for Money Programme, the National Collaborative Procurement and uh, Intelligent Automation. All of these uh, aim to reduce costs, increase efficiency and deliver better outcomes. And briefly, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government have already hollowed out the backroom staff in public services, such as Police Scotland, meaning that police officers have to spend more time in administration as opposed to working in their communities. How can the Scottish Government possibly suggest there are more cuts to be made in the backroom staff? Deputy First Minister. Well, first of all, um, Brian Whittle should, of course, understand from the budget that um, in difficult circumstances, we have prioritised frontline spend, including for police and fire. He will see that uh, from the budget. In terms of the efficiencies made by Police Scotland, I would be the first to recognise that, and their move, of course, to, um, to, to Police Scotland uh, has um, enabled a number of reforms and a number of efficiencies uh, to be made. What I'm uh, saying here in re response to Ivan McKee is that across the whole of the public sector, there are opportunities for organisations to share services, to do things differently, to use digital technology to deliver more effective and efficient services. And given the austerity budget uh, provided by the UK government, these uh, matters become even more important. So we'll get on with the reform that we need to make. And of course, always, always uh, welcome uh, for positive suggestions, presiding officer. There just seem to be very few and far Thank between. Thank you. Question number seven, Evelyn Tweed. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is regarding any potential impact on Scottish public finances to reports that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is considering reducing taxes in the UK budget in March. Minister Tom Arthur. The UK Government should use any additional fiscal headroom to support public services they have decimated through 14 years of underinvestment. The IMF agrees with this position and has advised the UK against further tax cuts. 
saying that proposed UK spending plans were unrealistic and that money should be spent prioritising health and education, for example, and reducing debt. The Deputy First Minister met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury two weeks ago and made clear that instead of tax cuts, the Chancellor must prioritise investment in public services, infrastructure and support for people with the cost of living crisis. Evelyn Tweed. Recent UK government spending decisions have meant that Scotland's block grant has fallen in real terms by 1.2 per cent since 2022-23. Does the Minister agree that the UK Government should be using its spring budget to rectify the mistakes of the Chancellor's autumn statement and provide adequate investment in our public services rather than prioritising tax cuts? Minister. While the UK Government has chosen to prioritise tax cuts at the expense of the NHS and other public services, our values and therefore our choices are very different. Our missions and values of equality, opportunity and community were the guiding principles of our 2024-25 budget to protect people, to sustain public services, to support a growing and sustainable economy and to address the climate and nature of emergencies. <coughs> so yes, we do call on the UK Government to invest in these important issues at the upcoming spring budget rather than offering more tax cuts. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause um, before we move on to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.